morning, everyone. I have uh, 10 o'clock and a couple extra seconds here. So we're going to open the February Ag Dialogues. Uh, those of you that haven't done anything yet, this is your first warning. Um, it is Valentine's Day. So if you didn't get a card or anything, now would be the time uh, to do that before you see that significant other or favorite pet or child um, coming up later on today. So. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Matt Dearson. He's going to kick off today's presentations. So with that, I will turn it over to Matt and we will go from there. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm gonna share some thoughts today on the current cattle market situation. Heather, would you give me a thumbs up if you can uh, see the slides? I can see the slides. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll begin. Um, I'm coming to you today from the uh, Ness School of Management and Economics uh, located in Harding Hall on the campus of South Dakota State University. I'm the Extension Risk and Business Management Specialist uh, and I actually teach a class uh, later this morning. So whenever I'm done, I'm gonna bow out for the remainder of the dialogue so I can go down to the basement and uh, get things ready for class. Um, we're gonna take a look at the cattle markets in general. Uh, it's the year end, so we'll take a look at uh, some of the inventory levels that came out of the cattle inventory report that NAS released uh, at the end of January. So those numbers are fresh. It gives us a perspective of uh, the general supply situation. Uh, we'll look at that specifically for some, some of the uh, numbers in South Dakota and then the United States as a whole. We're gonna shift and look at seasonality of South Dakota cash prices for the um, major classes of cattle. We're gonna talk about basis in the same way. So talk about live cattle, feeder cattle, and stocker cattle basis. And then we'll look at prices uh, as we wrap things up. Big picture in South Dakota, just, just for perspective, it used to be the case that there would be pronounced cattle cycles that you could see showing up in the South Dakota inventory numbers. However, for the last, oh, I'd say decade and a half, inventory levels in terms of all cattle and calves have been fairly stable, um, not subject to the huge or widest swings you'd see in the national numbers. Um, the causes for that, I suppose, would be just just the stability of uh, cow-calf operations kind of through time. Um, you're not having the wide swings that you used to see. But the 2020 number there coming in at about 1.8 million head, or sorry, about 3.8 9 million head uh, for South Dakota inventories down just slightly from a year ago. Um, some of the breakouts of, of what's happening with some of the numbers here, we've got beef cows, uh, dairy cow numbers are actually up, beef cow numbers were down just a little bit um, year over year. And then we can see here at the bottom, we've also got the beef replacement heifers. Uh, that number is down a little bit in South Dakota and nationally. Uh, the replacement rate, if you want to think about it, about that. Um, you could take the ratio of beef replacement heifers to beef cows. South Dakota, that number comes in at about 20 percent, a little higher than the national average, well, but just to put that number in perspective a little bit. Uh, so the same thing happening at the national level is happening in South Dakota. Slight contraction or, or end of expansion phase, if you would, um, related to the beef side of things. A smaller number of beef cows and heifers translated into a slightly smaller calf crop uh, for the last calendar year. So for 2019, that's why you don't see a 2020 number that calf crop refers to calves born during 2019. Um, you've got the feeder cattle supply outside of feedlots and the on feed numbers. So total number on feed in South Dakota up a little bit compared to a year ago, uh, consistent with the national number and then the feeder cattle outside of feedlots specifically for South Dakota. So that would be calves, steers, and heifers not deemed to be replacement heifers. Less the number on feed gives you the feeder cattle outside of feedlots. That number's down a little bit. That's more relevant at the national level, but I wanted to show it at the South Dakota level. Um, the other thing, digging a little bit into the cattle on feed numbers, specifically in South Dakota, uh, this is a breakout of total numbers on feed. So the large feedlots, which would be reported in cattle on feed reports, 
Um, their numbers are fairly steady. Um, but when you add in about half the market share would be sort of controlled by smaller feedlots or feedlots with less than a thousand head in South Dakota. You can see that's a substantial part of South Dakota's overall cattle inventory uh, and their number of cattle on feed uh, was up slightly from last year, but down from where the numbers were for both classes, um, slightly down from two years ago. Here's the national picture. We can see here that more pronounced um, cattle cycle over time. You have higher highs, lower lows, or just more extremes. And we can see too that at the national level here in the most recent period, um, just a slight decline in the overall total cattle inventory. This isn't beef production, but it's total number of cattle on uh, all classes on hand. Why the slight decline? There was a, a slight increase in heifer or in cow slaughter throughout much, much of 2019. So that's reduced the overall inventory level. Now, where are the cattle located? Um, focused here on just the beef calf crop. So about 28 million head of beef calves were born during 2019. You can see the darker the state shaded here, the higher the inventory. So Texas kind of leads the, leads the nation there with over 4 million head of, of beef calves, uh, followed by Missouri and then Oklahoma, and then coming in in uh, fifth place, if you would, would be South Dakota with 1.7 million head of beef calves born during um, last year. So the graph's kind of instructive. It shows where the majority of uh, beef calf production takes place. Uh, I'd also like to point out here, these three states, uh, Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas, um, did report um, as of January 1, a decrease in calves grazing on uh, winter wheat pastures. Uh, it sounds like the weather situation has improved in the Southern Plains, it might lead to more calves being placed or run on grass or on wheat pastures here in the short run. But um, from a year over year perspective, the number was down as of January 1st, um, which would mean less frame size on some of those calves which would mean lower placement weights once they hit the feedlot or, uh, and maybe shorter time on feed. So um, generally that would be seen as, as sort of a mixed news. You kind of have to weigh both the um, lighter frames, the fact that you might be seeing more of those cattle in feedlots in the short run. Um, maybe it's good news if you think about the second half of 2020 as far as where fed cattle prices might end up. Um, Couple other national snapshots. Uh, this is the national view of feeder cattle supplies outside of feedlots. So that number is down slightly. So number of cattle on feed is up, but the number available outside of feedlots is down compared to a year ago. So short run supply pressure on the, on the finished cattle side of things. But as you get to the second half of the year, you've got fewer calves to, to serve as replacements to restock those pens. Uh, which should give some upside uh, potential, at least, to prices. The other national snapshot would be the beef cow replacements. A couple things are evident here. We can see that in 2020, again, the number of beef cow replacements was down. Um, this is the third year in a row of a decrease. Typically, you end up with four or five years of declines, and that the level um, is not anywhere, it's not down below the 5.5 million head of replacements uh, and not anywhere near the, say about 5.1, 5.2 million head back here in 2011. So there would still be room for additional contraction uh, if you think about this in terms of cattle cycle terms. Uh, and there's no guarantee that these cattle cycles, you know, are gonna continue to follow these patterns, but just wanted to throw it out there uh, to put the numbers in perspective. And relative to, um, if we back up to when that cattle report was released, you know, it was a little bit of a surprise in terms of, of more beef replacements. This number came in a little bit above trade expectations, but the cow number came in a little below trade expectations. So when you add it all up, it's kind of a wash and the trade was, was 
pretty much um, spot on with their their estimates. Um, the shift gears now and look at a couple or a few seasonality charts. So usually at the end of the end of a calendar year, it's nice to sit down, gather up some prices, and, and just see if there's been any major shifts over time in terms of seasonality or overall price trends. Uh, so that's what we've done here. We've gathered up uh, monthly average prices. These come from the Ag Marketing Service. Uh, this is slaughter steer prices. These would be specific to South Dakota and actually specific to the Sioux Falls Regional Livestock uh, auction location down in Worthing, South Dakota. So all these prices are for slaughter weight steers only, uh, generally grading choice two to three, sometimes two to four, uh, depending on the month, because I've got 10 years, uh, the last 10 years of data or price history of 10 years, uh, most of that from Sioux Falls Regional. You can see here, we look at the middle line, uh, the orange line here, you've got a strong seasonal pattern in live cattle or fed cattle prices. Um, this is this is in effect nationally and it's in effect in South Dakota as well. When there's fewer cattle available on the market, uh, I tend to have a little seasonal high. When there's a fair number uh, available, you tend to have some seasonal pressure on price. Um, tends to hold um, sort of year in, year out. You can see this in the cash prices and it carries over into, um, we'll see it in the basis chart as well. Um, so for example, right now, kind of the consensus forecast uh, among multiple analysts for a price level for uh, fed cattle for 2020 is to be in that $120 range. So you could use this index and say, okay, 105% of the 120 would give you some idea of an April high and about 95% would give you some idea of a September low to expect. You can also see here, we've got a very narrow range uh, or not much seasonal variability in the middle of uh, middle of summer and then prices can kind of move one way or another a little bit more as we head into the end of the year or beginning of the following year. So that's their seasonality on fed cattle. On feeder cattle, I've had to do something a little bit different. Um, over the last 10 years, there's been several different weight classes represented by the CME feeder cattle index or what the futures prices represent. Um, rather than try to mix a bunch of those prices together to look at seasonality, uh, I, I used a seven to 800 pound steer price for South Dakota as collected by AMS and, and gathered and collected for us through the Livestock Marketing Information Center. So the LMIC uh, gathered up the data that you see on this chart here, seven to 800 pound steers, so feeder cattle steer. Um, the seasonality is not is shifted a little bit through the year, so you tend to have a higher seasonal price level in the middle of summer, and the low would happen generally in February of the year. Um, so also you end up, similar to the live cattle, with a very wide um, possible range of moves, or historically prices are, are much less seasonally consistent when we look at the very end or very beginning of the year. It's reflected in the much wider standard deviations uh, observed here. Third seasonal price I wanted to highlight was the stocker cattle price. So this would be a five to 600 pound uh, steer sold at a South Dakota sale barn as reported by the Ag Marketing Service. Um, I maintain a price series I just gather from uh, the weekly um, AMS price report. So uh, this data set would be available from uh, from me if you would be interested in, in getting behind the scenes. Um, but you can see you've got the same, roughly the same pattern that you observe in the feeder cattle. Um, I would discount observations in, in June and July and maybe early August because we don't have that many five to 600 pound steers sold in South Dakota during those time frames. So, I mean, you have to you have to sort of take that into account when you look at those prices, but that same wider variation as we get to um, the end of a calendar year. Now, how does that carry over into looking at basis? Well, that same strong seasonal pattern means that when you look at basis, and basis is defined as the difference between cash price 
and in general, you're looking at a nearby futures price. So on live cattle, you've got futures contracts um, in the even months of the year. So futures contracts on fed cattle in February, April, June, August, October, December. The cash price is the monthly cash price. So that seasonality that shows up in the cash price carries over into the basis. Uh, it's most evident here if we look at fed cattle basis during the month of May. It's very wide. It just means that in general, the cash price during May has been much higher than the more deferred futures price, uh, which would be the June contract in this case, just reflecting a typical seasonal decline in prices from April through May into June. So having a cash price measured during a high month against the futures price reflecting the end of the next month, May versus June futures, um, you tend to have this strong seasonal pattern show up. So basis tends to be positive uh, during March, April, May, June, and July in South Dakota on those fed cattle, and then negative, and usually somewhat more pronounced, um, September, October, November, December, and then a little bit into February as well. Um, this is a five-year average basis, so the average of the months observed uh, from 2015 to two, through 2019. I find that five-year average to be pretty a pretty reasonable um, number of years to include, kind of uh, smooths out some of the extremes you see and keeps that consistent, uh, reflects what you'd normally expect to have in terms of seasonality. So I would actually use this uh, for planning purposes. So if you're looking at a, a basis level to use on typical fed cattle uh, to be sold in October, I'd look at say a $4, a, a negative $4 basis for planning purposes. Um, the May was a little bit influenced by uh, a fairly, uh, fairly high basis level observed in um, 2018 on May. So you might take that down a little bit. On feeder cattle, tend to have a little bit different relationship. Feeder cattle are gonna reflect um, the general quality level of feeder cattle in, in South Dakota, in this case, relative to um, the overall feeder cattle or the national feeder cattle market. So you've kind of got a cash price against um, the national futures price, which reflects national cash prices. South Dakota are, uh, sales are part of that all the time. Uh, we can see here the basis on feeder cattle tends to have a little bit of a seasonal high in the middle of summer, but again, you've got low volume happening during that time. Uh, in general, five to six dollar positive basis on feeder cattle would reflect generally uh, the quality premium expected. Again, this is cash price for South Dakota, and this would be all weight classes included over the last five years uh, compared to whatever the nearby futures is. So these June and July prices are against or marked against an August futures price. Finally, we've got the stocker cattle basis or a five to six weight basis. Again, this would be a five to six weight steer price. Um, AMS reported prices for South Dakota locations uh, relative to the feeder cattle futures price. So June and July prices here would be relative to an August futures price, for example. November would be a November cash price against November feeder cattle futures. So that basis historically, or the last five years, has been um, around $40 for most, month, most months. And then when the bigger runs happen in the fall, you tend to have more of a $25 basis. Um, so something else to consider, and I would enter this caveat with the, with the calf basis here, the stocker cattle basis, uh, you really want to take a look at feed costs. They do much more to drive um, how big this basis is relative to the feeder cattle market. Um, it kind of swamps most of the other effects, and it really uh, does a better job of, than just strictly looking at the historics. So historics can help provide some perspective, but I'd temper it or, or you know, check that against uh, the current feed cost. Just take a... Uh, take a good ration of corn and hay um, to take a five weight up to a seven or eight weight to just kind of uh, check that number out over time. That's it for the basis. Um, do you want to show?
The general price level, all those cash prices um, have declined from the peaks we saw 2014, 2015, and, and they've been, um, historically speaking, or recent history, uh, relatively stable. As far as price projections, I'll offer just a couple up here. Uh, we do have um, the USDA's long-term price projections. Uh, these numbers were released back in November. Uh, next week, the USDA's Outlook uh, conference happens in Washington, D.C. They may be providing some, um, they have at times provided different uh, sets or updated sets of numbers, or at least more detail behind these numbers. So these are subject to change a little bit, but gives you some idea of what the USDA is expecting in terms of um, the next couple of years, inventories continuing to decline. The calf price for 20 would be in that one, um, the $160 range, and they've got that jumping up to 180 next year. That tends to correlate fairly well with the cash price for five to six weights observed in South Dakota. So what that means is one more year of, or another couple of years of contraction um, would lead to a higher price expectation. So that's where this year's calf price expected to be a little bit higher than last year, and the next year should be much better uh, than the last couple of years, um, should these numbers and inventory levels play out as expected. Um, one other set of price projections to go with this, the LMIC's price projections for the calendar year 2020 for live cattle are about $120 uh, for, the, for the full year. Feeder cattle, they've got it about $150 for the national price. So if you add on a $5 or $6 basis, I think you're looking at $155 for South Dakota. And then with the calf price or stocker price, uh, so think calves to be sold in, in November this year, uh, they're looking at 170 uh, for a price. Then you add on um, a quality adjustment to bring up, uh, to go from Southern Plains cattle to Northern Plains cattle. Uh, I'd add $5 to that. So I'd be using about a 175 as a, as a rough planning price for calves to be sold uh, this fall. I'd feel remiss if I didn't talk about volatility for just a second. Uh, on the live cattle right now, volatility is sitting in that 16% area. If you look at this would be the June contract. The June at the money is about a 16% volatility. Uh, that's a, that's a mid-level, maybe a little bit high volatility. Uh, to put that into perspective, compared that volatility to the picture observed, a year earlier, and we saw the volatility a year ago at this time for the same June contract at the money uh, was down around that low 11% range. So um, think about like a 30, 40% increase in volatility from last year to this year. Um, so that means nearby at the money options or short term uh, cost to, to um, layoff risk in the fed cattle market and the feeder cattle market uh, they're both rather high right now if we look at the current volatility situation and we get out there to october uh, and february of 2021 volatility falls way down again or back down to pretty much levels seen a year ago so short run price levels aren't so great there is some upside potential in the second half of the year in the fed cattle, which would carry over to feeder cattle, which would carry over to calves. And the volatility is not crazy high uh, in those deferred months right now on the live cattle. So it might present some opportunities uh, as we move through the year uh, to get some uh, price protection in place. Um, that is what I had for uh, prepared remarks. Heather, do I have any questions out there? Don't have any questions in the chat, but if anybody um, has something that's came to mind and they would like to ask a question before we let Dr. Dearson go teach his class, now's your chance. Matt, this is Jack. Yeah. Well, what do you think is causing that volatility to do um, so much over last year? Yeah. Uh, you've got, 
you've got a fair amount of risk in the fed cattle market. You've got a fair amount of risk in, in, um, in the proteins right now. Um, everything from trade disruption to concern about, um, just prices in general, and you've had recent price declines. So fed cattle and feeder cattle on the board, uh, the April, April live cattle contract has fallen about $10 a hundred weight since, uh, that October, November timeframe. Um, and that, that has coincided with an increase in volatility. There's been some funds liquidating out of the, out of the cattle, um, contracts. So that's maybe been part of the cause of some of the price pressure, uh, and that's adding to the volatility. So just the cost to lay off risk in the short run has been pushed up. This isn't the case in the, in the grains, um, but there you've got a much different uh, overall supply situation. So, you know, just, and, and relative to last year, last year at this time was, was just a, a little bit unusually low um, volatility in, uh, in the live and feeder markets too at, at this time. So do you think we're ahead of the seasonal a little bit maybe for, for this year, being as we have come down, or do you think that's going to, you know, I'm stuttering through my question here probably. Did we put the seasonal highs in already? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the That's hard to say. Um, some negative things in the short run on this market, you've got, you've got the bigger supply of cattle on feed right now. Um, and, weights are steady so i mean you've got large production um at the same time you know there there is an end to that uh is that going to happen before or to give us a, a, a another rally if you would um in april and june that's hard to say i'm more optimistic in the second half of the year uh for prices to come up a little bit more from where they're at currently so it doesn't, I, don't, I feel like I'm skirting your answer. To well, that. I did. And I, I probably was trying to pin you down more on price and I didn't mean to do that, Matt. No, so, that's, that's good. Yeah. Uh, let's, um, uh, one other thing, exports. Do you see, you know, we got a trade deal with Japan and maybe China will s square up. And do you, do you see anything coming there? Upside potential. But I mean, it's, it's, it's not going to be, um, I, I don't see it giving a huge pop overnight. Um, just slowly, steadily gaining access to more markets should be positive. Um, sounds like things are starting to turn around in, uh, Australia, for example, and other, you know, other competing places, um, which might lend a little more support. Um, but that's, yeah, I, that's, that's a lot to, uh, uh, to bank on in the short run. So, yeah. So not, nothing major really just going to take off or anything. Po positive just... things again, I mean, longer term. So yeah. I, I think there's several things you've got, you've got fewer calves likely this year and, um, feeder cattle outside of feedlots is better. So, um, but we've also got a fair, I mean, the, in addition to record high beef production, you've got record high pork production, record high poultry production. There's a lot of meat in the supply chain at this time. So that's going to keep a short run lid on things too. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. Anyone else at this time? Otherwise we Can I do will... a quick commercial, Heather? Yes. Do a quick commercial. All right. And then I'm going to, I'm going to bail. Um, one of the things we do in our class, uh, I teach the commodity trading class uh, spring semester here. Um, we use the uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, their uh, trading simulator. Anybody can use that one. That's kind of nice because it lets us trade. Uh, um, they can paper trade um, live cattle futures and options contracts. Um, another thing that the general public is invited to uh, come along with um, you can see my screen here. I've got a web browser pulled up with a commodity challenge. Uh, we have established a trading uh, simulation or game in here, and I'm going to log in real quick. Um, anybody's free to 
log in or join uh, Commodity Challenge. And if they do, they're going to get to a screen like this. And if you click on Join a Game, it's going to take you to a big game or a big list of open games. There's several SDSU classes that are um, actively using some of these. And one game I'd call the public's attention to is this one, SDSU NSME 20. Um, it doesn't show up in my list of available games because I'm already in it. Uh, but the uh, Nest School of Management Economics, we, we're running this game and um, four different commodity marketing classes at SDSU are uh, inviting their students to join in on this game. And if you do, you'll find out that you are a corn producer with uh, Watertown, South Dakota as your cash location, and you have 100,000 bushels of corn uh, to try to market between now. And um, here we've kind of got our tentative harvest date of October 15th showing up. So it gives you the, uh, the flexibility to place futures and options and cash forward contract. Again, this is selling corn, uh, but, but it is a fun, uh, a fun exercise to go through and it's open to anybody willing to uh, um, log in to Commodity Challenge. But if you select the SDSU NSME 2020 corn, uh, you're going to be sort of competing, I guess, with uh, um, several different classes of students at SDSU. So um, thank you, Heather, for letting me uh, plug, the, plug the game. And uh, I better go down and go to class. Is there a time frame for cutoff kind of I suppose uh, sooner the better we we really don't have a cutoff um we set it up to run from uh, uh all year so we wanted students in classes this spring to be able to get in and start putting a marketing plan together and hedge these uh hedge these bushels if students take a class during the summer they might jump in and and even this fall um jump in, see how they did or see how they're doing, or maybe just join a little late. So um, it's, okay. it's a Thanks setup that. to be that flexible throughout the year. And it's kind of fun. Okay, so I don't have any extra questions that have came in for you, Matt. So thank you for your time this morning. And uh, with that, we will let you go to class. And Jack, I will turn the power of the screen sharing over to you. Jack, we need you to unmute your microphone as well. Yes, I wanted to get that pulled up uh, before I got started there. Ah, let me, uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, uh, just a slight in introduction or short introduction. Jack Davis, a crops business management field specialist. I'm in the Mitchell office at, at, uh, that's on the MTI campus. So that's our location. That's where I'm broadcasting to from today. Uh, gonna do a couple things. Gonna go over real quick some choices for Farm Bill as that sign up is still continuing. And then we'll look at crop insurance, really kind of taking a look at it from a, a feeder's perspective and, and why you might want to buy it to help protect. Your, your feed resource. So we'll get started on the farm bill. So our choices again are the individual ARC risk coverage, uh, price loss coverage in the, in the county, ARC county or the, the countywide coverage. I think guys <coughs> will want to take a look at the individual uh, ARC and in places where that will work is if a FSA farm has has been 100% prevent plant in 2019, they'll be eligible probably for the maximum payment that that will be available. Uh, 
doesn't say what's going to happen in 2020, but if they have a, a farm that was completely prevent plant, meaning no covered commodities were planted on that farm in 19, they sure want to take a look at that. Also, if they did plant a few acres, uh, trying to lower maybe crop insurance premiums and those yields didn't come in as expected. I know that I've heard of that happening as guys are finishing up some harvesting that there's really some quite uh, low yields. So it may also benefit those to look at ARC IC for, for the two years coming up. Again, you're signing up this initial sign up or election is for the 19 year and the 20 year. So take a look if you've had a lot of prevent plant problems on, on your farm in, in 19. Don't just dismiss the, the ARC IC. So now I'll just go uh, by the different crops. Um, so corn, we would probably not expect either um, a PLC or an ARC payment because, yeah, they're just, it's not going to be below the, the guarantee. Our guarantee is fairly low compared to what it was back in 2014 and 15. Um, if that county, if you had a county that was uh, quite low in yield, the county as a whole, that may pay it in, in our county. Now, um, the ag statistics is coming with their estimates on February 20th. So it would give you somewhat of an idea of what the county yield may be. That has switched. It won't be exactly that. That has switched to, to RMA yields using that data first, and then if it needs supplemental data, looking to the, the ag statistics. Uh, looking forward, if as things have maybe uh, cleaned up around the nation, not necessarily in South Dakota, but guys will be ready to plant corn and we could we could see quite a bit of corn planted and that would lean towards PLC as being maybe a, a better choice. So guys got to evaluate that for their individual individual farms. And soybeans, uh, the support price or the effective price is is quite a bit below where our current market is. Uh, so PLC is not really expected to, to make payments in that. And in our county may be a better choice in, in soybeans. Again, evaluate for your, for your own farm. And last one, um, wheat tends to kind of favor PLC. I know ARC has made some payments, but that uh, support pr price or effective price, rep, I'm looking for the right term here, it's reference price. The reference price is uh, it's fairly high on wheat and our market year average has tended to be below that over the past few years. So PLC is probably a good choice there. Also take a look at your PLC yield. That may be the difference between whether you would choose uh, PLC or ARC County on, on the, uh, for wheat. Again, here are the resources with, with FSA website, which holds a lot of the information, and then also the, the farm doc and a fast tool that you can use for uh, comparing individual choices on your farm. So hopefully we, some of this water can go down and uh, we'll take a look at crop insurance. So the main one we're gonna look at is uh, RP or revenue protection. That is what is most widely sold or purchased in South Dakota. About 70% uh, of the purchase of, of crop insurance is, is a revenue protection. It protects against loss due to yield and price. And you can choose your coverage level anywhere from 50 to 85% of the actual production history, which is the APH yield. And price is 100% of the higher of the projected price or the harvest price. Um, so it gives you a, a low price protection and also if we would have a national disaster, uh, harvest price protection. 
So that's really helpful for uh, livestock producers that are also growing, growing their own feed. They can kind of lock in some of that cost or protect it, I should say, uh, by taking the revenue insurance. Um, the majority of policies that are sold insure in that 70 to 75 per percent level. That just kind of seems to be uh, pretty common in South Dakota. I know you get to some of the other states, the Eastern states, and they bump that to the 80, 85. Just their APHs are that much better. Their risk is not as bad much as it is in South Dakota. So those policies become a little cheaper out there, but for you get um, very far west in South Dakota and those become really kind of cost prohibitive for, for guys. Uh, prevent plant is uh, corn pays 55% of the guarantee and you can do a 5% buy up. Now, if, if people were interested in doing that, they would wanna be in and talking with their agent uh, now and see if they could get that. I know last year with the, with the anticipation of being wet, some of the, they, they weren't allowed to do that if they had not been doing it in the past. And I haven't heard uh, what companies are doing this year, but that is an option. Uh, many, many firms or insurance agencies have their customers buying that already and they're in, but if they haven't been buying it, uh, be sure and get a, go ahead of that March 15th, because if you wait that long, you may not, and, and that'll of course be up to the to the company and and your policy. So indemnity is based on the, the actual yield and and the harvest price and how that comes in. As I said, enterprise unit is the most widely used. It is you can get the most coverage for your dollar invested in insurance. It is quite a bit better. A lot of the old one that people used was individual sections. They insured the farm in that individual sections. What this enterprise unit does, it throws all your fields in to, together or farms together. So it's the, your yield as a farm as a whole. And that fits well with, uh, with feeders and livestock producers because they're not, they're not concerned where the feed comes from so much, yet, but having that protection on the total volume of, of feed that they would have available. So it allows them to purchase that coverage in, in a cheaper manner. And the premiums are based on the county, um, the unit structure, we talked about enterprise, and uh, also then the APH yield that they have, the better yield they have, the more coverage they can get for a, a certain price. And then again, as I said, price, the election that they would choose. As of yesterday, here's our uh, projected price, which is the new crop averages, or December for corn, November for soybeans, uh, during February. So the futures price average during February, and corn right now, new crop December corn has been right at three, 392. So a little below last year, last year it was at four. Uh, beans, I think, ended up at 946 last year, and currently they're right at 919. Of course, we got um, about half the month in, and uh, we'll see whether that changes. I can't see it changing too much from here, but we'll, we'll see where that falls out. So just a few examples on how it might work. I picked a 75% coverage level, so it tends to be fairly common. Also then 100 acres, I, did a, I kept that projected price at 392 and the harvest price went down a little bit. The APH on this 100 acre farm was 155. They ended up with an actual production of 125 in, in the end, so they went down a little bit. So their guarantee is the bushels times our, our 75%, and then um, three, 392 as our, our spring price. So it kept that spring price versus the, the harvest price, it was higher. So here's our revenue that they actually got or that will count against our guarantee. 
So 125 times our 340 price, so they would have picked up about $30, $31 an acre um, to help purchase uh, feed or pay other expenses. So we'll just look at a, couple, a few examples here. Another one in this example, um, let me see if this came through right. Yeah. That's the same one. Okay, here we go. So this example, 75% again, 392, but harvest price went up and we had a little less yield than on the last one. So still that same guarantee, but no, sorry. Our guarantee goes up now because our harvest price is greater than the, that spring price or projected price. So guarantees at 494, here would have been what we measured against or count for our production in revenue. So this one offering an indemnity payment per acre of, of 26, almost $27. No. And uh, going on to the next one, a prevent plant situation where our harvest price went, went up again. So our guarantee, our guarantee stays with our spring price. It does not go up with the on prevent plan situation. So we're at 455.70 for our, our guarantee. And we didn't have the buy up in this farm. So 55% of our guarantee gives us an indemnity payment of, of 250 an, an acre. So for the farm of 100 acres, they would receive 25,000 about in, in this one. Of course, premiums would have to come off of that, but it does protect them against those disasters, allowing some money to uh, pay some expenses and or purchase uh, feed resources. Uh, just some reminders, the sales closing date is March 15th. Many of the agencies are having their updates coming up here uh, shortly. Uh, prevent plant rules go back to the 2018 standards. We know we got to harvest. They made a good move last year and we got to harvest September 1st. That goes back to November 1st. So uh, keep, keep track of that and uh, things go back to what it was in, in 18 and until we hear, hear different. Uh, one that I heard today and visiting with some agents and agencies, uh, old water is not available for prevent plants. So we, in my situation here at, in Mitchell, we're right along the James River. The James River has not gone back into its banks. So if that would happen to not go back in before spring planting, those acres could be denied for, for prevent plants. So something guys will wanna watch out for and be aware of. Uh, other things they could do there, you know, say it, it didn't go in and they're denied coverage, if it would happen to go in before summer growing season was over, they could go in and, and just not insure those acres because it was denied and plant some forage and harvest it in a timely manner. If, if it would, if weather conditions would allow. So those would be some options for guys that are on, on that river bottom land. That's what I have, Heather. If uh, anybody has any questions, they can sure shoot them my way. A uh, quick call for questions, if anybody has any out there. Okay, I guess seeing no questions, um, we have about 10 minutes left, so I will try to wrap up in that 10 minute time frame. Um, and we'll, we'll finish up here and move on. Um, while I'm getting my uh, presentation pulled up here, a quick reminder that we'll do the egg dialogues again. Um, what do I? in March, on March 13th. So if you wanted to 
include that in your calendar planning. Uh, we'll be doing this again in March. It doesn't want to start at the beginning. Mine was jumping too. I just had to pull it back, I think, so. Okay, well, let's see. Maybe it'll start from this slide. Okay, well, what we're going to kind of cover here as we fill, uh, finish for the day is a short conversation about making the, the best out of our feed dollars that we might have available um, right now. Uh, with the, the wet situation last spring and summer, forage quality might not be what we usually anticipate it to be. So one of the things we really are encouraging everybody to do is those feed tests. Make sure that you're getting your forages tested so that accurate balanced rations can be created for you. Uh, make sure that you know what maybe your uh, the weight of your corn was lighter than normal. So make sure when you're putting in so many pounds of corn, because that's what your bucket on your loader usually weighs, make sure that still fits the bill for this year. Um, I'm a big proponent of if you don't measure it, you can't management. Uh, manage it in a very efficient manner. And I believe this year that's going to be one of those, those big considerations we need to take in under our advisement throughout the year. So make sure that you're getting your feed tests done, especially testing corn uh, that was put in a bin wet for some of those myotoxins, aflatoxins, those types of things. Make sure that we're looking into that um, potential issue that we have there. Um, the next thing I really wanna talk about is the feed nutrient calculator. This calculator is available on the SDSU Extension webpage as one of our decision aid tools. And as I've been told, uh, it has a lot of numbers on it. So I actually wanna walk you through uh, just what some of those numbers mean because it's kind of a numbers overload situation. And once people have found what it really does and what it can do for them, they really appreciate the cal calculator here and use it a lot. So hopefully you can see this on your screen right now. It's an Excel-based calculator. And anywhere there is a yellow cell in that calculator, you can input your numbers. Um, it does come pre-populated with numbers and information. And if you've listened to very many of my presentations about budgets or putting your numbers together, I'm a pretty big advocate of you need to use your own data and your own numbers. So as you go through here, these numbers of the current price per ton are probably not accurate. And they're probably not accurate on purpose because I need you to make your own calls to your field um, or your feed reps to make sure that we're getting the right prices for the options that might be available to you um, for either protein supplements or energy supplements. This uh, spreadsheet will help you look at both of them. What the feed value calculator really does is help you analyze your energy supplements and protein supplements based on that energy unit. So we're not just talking about dollars per bushel or dollars per ton of, of the total product, but based on the crude protein and the TDN and the energy that these uh, different feedstuffs provide for your operation so that we can maybe look at making the most balanced feed ration at the least cost possible. So as I mentioned, you can input any of your numbers into the yellow cells. You need to make those phone calls to the feed suppliers and find out what the current price is and enter them in on a per ton basis. Uh, talk to somebody about uh, trucking costs in your area and what it would cost to get a load of the feed stuff brought out to your operations and input that number here. Then you need to put in how many tons per load um, of that feed stuff you're going to be hauling in. You'll notice here that every one of those cells says 26 tons per load. That's not going to be accurate for every feed stuff. There's things like wheat mids and soybean hulls that are much lighter 
um, on a per volume basis. So per cubic square or per cubic foot of product, you're not gonna be able to get 26 tons per load of those um, items on that truck. So we need to know what a full load is. Then you can analyze different miles from the plant to your house where you're going to be utilizing them. And then the calculation does the adjusted price on a per ton basis. The nutrient composition is very important. Um, the numbers that are in here right now are based on the, the IRM Blue Book um, nutrient compositions, uh, traditional and most common averages for the feedstuffs that are listed. If you are using uh, distiller's grains from a certain ethanol plant and you know what their feedstuff usually runs, insert those numbers uh, so that you have the most accurate numbers and data to use as you go forward. So that's why all of these feed nutrient uh, boxes are yellow. You can change them to fit the current situation of the, of the feed stuff that you might be finding. So as you go down through that list, you can see it's highly populated. There's several options for you to evaluate and look at. And then towards the bottom, there's, well, what do we got? Six others. If you have a feedstuff available that's not listed on here, you can sure put that in. You know, if you want to evaluate cubes or different lick tub compositions, go ahead, insert those into the other categories, put the current prices, the freight, tons, miles, and the nutrient compositions in for those feedstuffs, and it'll let you do some analysis that way. So that's step one of the feed calculator. The next part that you're going to hit is step two down here on this tab where it gives you the results. The important thing to remember about the results is they're going to base it back um, and compare your energy supplements to the price of corn that you inputted on this input section and your protein supplements back to a 44% crude soybean meal. Uh, we needed a base to start from, and as those are some common uh, feedstuffs for energy and protein supplements, that's what we're using as our comparison factor. So if we hit the step two button in the results, you can see um, lots of information here. Again, the numbers pop up, and some of them are rather large. But in the first section of data, you're seeing the cost per unit of nutrient on a per ton basis. So if we're looking at adding an uh, energy source to our ration, we want to look at what the cost for net energy for maintenance and net energy for gain might be of those different supplements as we go down through the list. And here we can see, you know, net energy for corn, um, 144, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, per ton compared to the other options that are listed as well down into some of the distillers products if you're using some of those for energy sources as well. What you can see in the last two columns is what it pays relative to corn for energy. So if you're looking at buying dried beet pulp as an energy source, you can spend up to $98 per ton for that to get a relative similar amount of energy from corn. Uh, so it kind of gives you some of those break even prices uh, for lack of a, a better term there as you go forward. Um, and then it puts all the rest of the numbers in there as well for protein supplements as you go down the line. Anywhere where you see this uh, funny divide by zero um, exclamation point symbol, there wasn't enough information or numbers presented in the feed input section. So that is something that you need to be aware of and make sure that you're uh, in inputting all the correct and right data for the feedstuffs that you're looking at. Um, with that, uh, that's, that's the main part of the info that I have for you. Really wanna encourage you to be taking some feed samples getting the information available so that you're making the best um, feed decisions possible this year and putting balanced rations together at the most economical 
great for your operation. Um, even if you have to do something a little different than normal because the corn wasn't um, harvested in the manner that you had thought it was going to be or really wanted it to be, or didn't get the alfalfa or hay put up is have that as the highest quality uh, due to getting rained on maybe once, twice, three times as you tried to put it up this spring and summer. So with that, um, I'll answer any questions if anybody has any. Jack's still on the line if anybody has any questions for him. Um, otherwise, we look forward to seeing you uh, again on March 13th. If you have ideas or topics that you would like to see us cover that day, uh, please shoot us an email and uh, we'd be happy to get those included for you. Yeah, share with your friends. Right, and share the, share the links. Tell them to, to join the presentations. Uh, Heather, I don't think we can overemphasize the importance of testing and testing the forages this year. Um, just as an example, we were getting ready to feed cows on our farm and for calving and we had ground some alfalfa, which we thought was normal. I mean, it wasn't our worst <laughs> looking per se, wasn't the worst put up that we have. And I was very disappointed in the tests that came back. So. I think each time they prepare a new batch of feed, it's probably important to stay up on those tests. Our, actually, our corn, uh, we were pleasantly surprised with what corn we have, so we've got some extra energy there. But our normally our uh, alfalfa comes in about 19% protein or so. This was down around 10 or 11 and the moisture was right at 20 and it's not like it was um, icky hay and I didn't think we could bail it at that much wet but evidently uh, we did. And, yeah. yeah there's not much more expensive to an operation than thinking you're feeding something at a very at a higher level of protein than what it really is and you're yeah. not getting the gain yeah. and the results that you expected so yeah, yeah I would Highly back that up that spending $20, $30 on a feed test is yeah. one of the cheapest things that you can do for your operation this year. Yeah. Thank so you with for that, attending. I don't see any other questions or hands raised. So we will say thank you very much for joining us on this uh, Valentine's Day and we will see you uh, next month, March 13th. Thank you all. Thanks.